Hi, this is Amr Abdul Gawad from El Paso, Texas. We're going to speak today about obstetric brachial plexus palsy. What are the objectives for today's lecture? The first would like to describe the anatomy of the brachial plexus. This is very important because it allows us to understand the pathology. And this would we then would like to identify the risk factor for obstetric brachial plexus palsy. And then we would like to explain the clinical presentation of the most common type of obstetric brachial plexus palsy, which is the herbis palsy. And then we are going to outline what are the workup needed for these patients. And then finally, we're going to list the indications for orthopedic referral for patients with herbis palsy. I'd like to remind you here that herbis palsy is by far the most common um, clinical presentation of obstetric brachial plexus palsy, as we are going to see later on. Uh, if you need more information about this topic, you can go back to this book, which is Pediatric Orthopedic, a handbook uh, for primary care physician, written by myself and Dr. Naga. So let's discuss the anatomy of the brachial plexus. Um, knowing the anatomy is very important to understand the pathology. I know that the anatomy of the brachial plexus is very complicated, so we'll try to be uh, very simple in this description. Uh, the anatomy of the brachial plexus is formed of roots, trunks, division, cores, which will later on give the nerve branches. So it's root, trunks, division, and cores. There is five roots that give rise to the brachial plexus, C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. C5 and C6 will unite to form the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. C7 will continue as the middle trunk of the brachial plexus. C8 and T1 will give the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. So we have five roots that will give rise to three trunks. 5 and 6 will give the upper trunk, 7 will form the middle trunk, 8 and T1 will form the lower trunk. Then each trunk will give two division, anterior division and posterior division, anterior division and posterior division, anterior, divi anterior division and posterior division. The three posterior divisions will form the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. The anterior division of the upper and middle trunk will form the lateral cord. The anterior division of the lower trunk will form the medial cord. So we have five roots give rise to three trunks. Each trunk will give two divisions. Posterior divisions will form the posterior cord. Anterior division of the upper and the middle uh, trunks will form the lateral cord. And the anterior division of the lower trunk will form the medial cord of the brachial plexus. This area here, which is the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, the two roots uh, form the upper trunk, and then the upper trunk will give rise to um, two divisions are called the herbs point and this is where the herbs palsy happens so patients who have herbs palsy have an injury to this area here the upper trunk of the brachial plexus after we discuss the anatomy to speak about the pathological types of obstetric brachial plexus palsy we have three main types of obstetric brachial plexus palsy herbs palsy total palsy and clumpix palsy Herpes palsy, by far this is the most common type of obstetric brachial plexus palsy, is affection of the upper trunk of the brachial plexus as we saw before, C5 and C6, that area is called the herbs point. Total palsy is affection of all roots of brachial plexus, so it's C5, 6, 7, 8 and T1 and it will result in total flaccid limb. Clumpix palsy, this is the rarest form and the affection, uh, it's affection of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, so it's C8 and T1 and it's associated with Horner syndrome in about one-third of cases. Why is that? Because the uh, sympathetic ganglion is uh, close to C8 and T1, and it affects mainly the hand function. So we have three main pathological types, herbs palsy, by far the most common type, and we will discuss that type in details in the next slides. Total palsy is a result in total flaccid limb, uh, and it's affection of the orus of the brachial plexus. Clumpix palsy is affection of the hand, and it results from affection of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. So after we spoke about the anatomical types of obstetric brachial plexus palsy, we're going to discuss now the neurological or pathological types. There is three pathological types of uh, obstetric brachial plexus palsy, which are neuropraxia, axonotomesis, and neurotomesis. So neuropraxia is when you have stretching of the nerves and the recovery is usually complete with no residual symptoms. So kids with uh, um, herbs palsy who have a neuropraxia, uh, it's only stretching of their upper uh, cord of the brachial plexus and uh, we should expect in these cases a full recovery. The other two types is axonotomesis and neurotomesis. Axonotomesis, when you have injury to the nerve fibers, the axons, with, uh, um, with intact sheath around them. So these usually have a variable recovery, but it's never complete, and uh, there, uh, there's always some functional limitations uh, due to this injury. 
uh, the neurotimesis is when you have um, a disruption of both the nerve axons and the sheath. So it's total sever of the nerve or the, what we call the avunger injury, and this is the worst prognosis. So kids with herpes palsy who have a neuropraxia, we should expect that they will have full recovery. However, kids with neuropraxia that had an avulsion injury or neurotimesis, it means disruption uh, of the roots, complete disruption of the roots, these will have the worst prognosis. Let's speak now uh, about herpes palsy in more details. As we said before, herpes palsy is by far the most common uh, type of obstetric brachial plexus palsy. What is herpes palsy? Herpes palsy is nerve affection of the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. So it's affection of C5 and C6, as we said before, um, uh, during labor. So herpes palsy is affection of the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, C5 and C6. And it is the most common uh, type of obstetric brachial plexus palsy. What are the risk factors for herpes palsy? Um, it is a macrosomia, which means that the newborn is more than 4,000 gram, because that will require more traction also shoulder dystocia because it requires more traction and assisted labor like forceps delivery because that can cause compression over the brachial plexus. Let's speak now about the clinical presentation of herpes palsy. So we discussed before herpes palsy is the most common uh, form of obstetric brachial plexus palsy and it's due to affection of C5 and C6. And we discussed the risk factors, so we now go speak about the clinical presentation. So the newborn will present with what we we'll call waiter tip position, position. So if you see this position of the arm, we, it's look like the waiter tip position. So it's commonly known as the limb will be in the waiter tip position. What is the waiter tip position exactly? The shoulder will be abducted, internally rotated. So if you see this child, uh, she had a macrosomia, her mom uh, had a diabetes, and uh, she, there was excessive traction on both sides. So on the left side, she ended up having humeral fracture, and on that right side, she uh, had uh, the, uh, the herpes palsy. So if you see her uh, shoulder is adducted and internally rotated, also you can see this child has a adduction and internal rotation of the shoulder. The elbow is extended and pronated. It's obvious here the elbow is extended and pronated and the wrist is flexible. So the newborn will have the waiter tip position, as you can see here, the, which is adduction and internal rotation of the shoulder, extension and pronation of the elbow and wrist flexion. And also one of the things that um, is in the newborn is that the child will have asymmetrical motor reflex because the affected side, the shoulder cannot abduct as the normal side. This is the same child as this a uh, few months later. If you see, she still have uh, prone, uh, adduction and internal rotation of the shoulder. Her whole upper extremity is internal rotated because it's internal rotated at the level of the shoulder here. You, have, you can see the pronation. Um, uh, with time, the children starting having flexion of their elbow rather than extension. So what are the imaging studies that we do for the herpes palsy? Chest radiograph. In the chest radiograph, you may uh, see um, elevation of the diaphragm. If you see this, uh, this indicates that the phrenic nerve, which originates from three, three, C3, 4, and 5, close to the brachial plexus, has been affected. Uh, and this uh, tells you that this most probably is an avulsion injury. Uh, because the roots um, are affected uh, and this is a bad sign. So if you see elevation of the chest radiograph, um, elevation of the diaphragm, that means that the phrenic nerve which supplies the diaphragm is affected and that's most probably an, a root avulsion injury which has the worst prognosis, prognosis as we said before. You can see a clavicle fracture, is, uh, it may be an association um, because um, a clavicle fracture is also associated with shoulder dystocia as herpes palsy. Other two imaging studies that can be done in some cases are the MRI of the cervical spine or EMG or electrophysiological studies. MRI of the cervical st um, spine, if it's a root, uh, root avulsion injury, uh, there will be avulsion of the um, roots from the meninges and there will be some bulging of the meninges. That's called pseudomeningocele and that's again a bad prognostic sign because it indicates a, a, a avulsion injury. So MRI of the cervical spine in case of avulsion injury will show the pseudomeningocele. EMG studies and these are used to detect um, the um, regeneration of the nerves. Uh, they are very rarely um, used in herpes palsy. First because they cause lots of discomfort for the children. The second also because 
uh, they may detect some uh, electric regeneration of the muscle. However, the muscle are still weak are, and are not of clinical significance. So imaging studies, we usually do chest radiograph to see if there is a associate clavicle fracture and also assess if there is elevation of the diaphragm. Uh, MRI cervical spine, and this only done um, in case of planning early surgery to see if there is pseudomeningeal seal or not, which is an indication of root avulsion, and EMG is rarely done in children. So let's speak now about the prognosis of Arab's palsy, and this is very important because the family will ask you what's going to happen with our son or our daughter. So 80% of the patients with Arab's palsy will show complete recovery within the first three months, and about 90% of them will recover by the age of 12 months. Why is that? Because most of the injuries in Arab's palsy are neuropraxia. As we said before, neuropraxia is just stretching of the nerve, so it's physiological block to the nerve, and, a and this is usually cause uh, ends with complete recovery so 80% of the patients will show complete recovery by three months and 90% will recover by 12 months and these are neuropraxia and the majority of the cases that don't fully recover will have some sort of partial recovery so these are pictures for three children who had herbs palsy when they were born and these are pictures for them when in their childhood uh, they all have the most important deformity of the arm which is internal rotation deformity of the shoulder so this girl has an internal rotation of the, her arm here you see her whole arm is internally rotated she cannot externally rotate um, her uh, arm if you see here also the, this child we're comparing the right side which has herbs palsy to the left side the left side it can be passively external rotated um, to 90 degree this side because it has internal rotation deformity it cannot be passively external rotated and here also in the same side um, you see if this child wants to get his um, hand to the mouth uh, because of his internal rotation deformity he has to raise his uh, elbow all the way up to be able to put his um, hand into the mouth so what is the management of herpes palsy in newborns? So if you have a newborn that has diagnosed with obstetric brachial plexus palsy or herpes palsy, the management that you can do is rest of the arm for a few days followed by gentle range of the motion of the affected shoulder. So you uh, apply rest of the arm for a few days. You can do that with applying an ace wrap. Uh, over the arm or the elbow or you can use a safety clip connecting the sleeve to the gown of the child and then after maybe one week you can start uh, some gentle range of motion of the affected shoulder uh, there is no need for electric stimulation for these children what are the indications for orthopedic referral? When do you uh, um, refer a, ca a case of obstetric brachial plexus palsy or herpes palsy to the orthopedic surgeon? If there is no full recovery by three months, so if this child is now three and a half months and you don't see full recovery, his um, affected side is not uh, as the other side, you would refer that to an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, you, there is a um, there is an indications for early uh, uh, recovery, which if you see signs of root avulsion, because you know that root avulsion will not improve, so there is no need to wait for three months. The signs that you look for root avulsion is if you find Horner syndrome or you find phrenic nerve affection. In this case, you refer them early. Another indication for early referral, if this is a total palsy or clympex palsy, meaning if there is an affection of the hand function. Remember, in herbs palsy, the hand function is um, intact. So if you put your fingers into the child palm, he will have a reflex um, a, a compression and squeezing of your hand. Um, if you see that there is a hand affection, clumpix palsy, or if you see a total palsy, that's an indication for orthopedic referral. So orthopedic referral, if there is no full recovery by three months, there is two indications for early referral if you see signs of root avulsion or um, if it's a total palsy or clumpix palsy. So let's give a quick overview of the surgical management. So when you refer these kids for um, orthopedic surgeons, he will do um, either soft tissue release or osteotomies or muscle transfer. Uh, osteotomies mean that um, he is going to cut uh, the humeral bone and um, rotate it externally. Muscle transfer, we transfer the muscles uh, that cause internal rotation to act as an external rotators. Uh, the choice between these depends on the shape of the shoulder and the patient's age. If you can see, here is a picture 
picture of a child here is before surgery in order for him to do uh, for him to put his uh, hand on his mouth he has to raise his uh, shoulder all the way up uh, because of his internal rotation uh, after doing uh, the surgery for him and externally rotating the shoulder he can easily put his hand now on his mouth same as this girl this is before the surgery if you see because of her internal rotation deformity uh, for her to bring her hand to the mouth she has to raise her uh, arm all the way up after doing the surgery for her you can see the scar here she can easily put her hand into her mouth this is another example for a child who has a muscle transfer you see before surgery he was not able to externally rotate his arm um, his hand is internally rotated and if you see here a few months after surgery he can very easily externally rotate his arm thank you very much i'd like just to uh, enforce that these videos are for educational purpose only uh, if you have any concern please consult your doctor thank you